Okay, well, uh, welcome. Um, the main thing I, I need to do today is finish and then shut up so we can have a real discussion. And I have some, I've invited some people who I feel really have great contributions to make to this complex topic. Um, I'm going to re reveal a bit about myself first. Like, it's now 30 years since I came here for an MPH, and I think it's taken me a full 30 years to even get a glimmer of understanding of the intersection of race and class in this city. And I consider myself fairly intelligent, but it is so complex, and there's little historical tidbits that you really need to know. For, the, for example, the fact that Johns Hopkins Hospital was a white-only hospital. And if you're non-white and you had gone there in the 1950s, they would have referred you to Franklin Square Hospital. And that the medical school was male only. The major parks in Baltimore were white only. Black people could not go into Patterson Park, could not go into Druid Hill Park. Uh, the swimming pools, there were eight fairly large pools for white individuals and one fairly small pool for black individuals. And that legacy is still with us in that African Americans can't swim in large numbers. Um, and all of this seems like it's in the desperate past, but it really isn't. The Baltimore Sun, until the late 60s, would have want ads, uh, apartment for rent white, apartment for rent black, apartment for rent Jew, which seems inconceivable now, but it's not that long ago. It's still with us. Um, so the reason we're having this session at all is first, the problems facing Baltimore are immediate, they're compelling, and we can't pretend to be global health practitioners and not be thinking about Baltimore and what we owe Baltimore and how we need to work with Baltimore to get it out of its current um, difficult situation. Um, and second, you know, I, I run into students every year and they tell me, well, you know, I'm really interested in global health. I'm planning on working in Namibia or Bangladesh or Paraguay and I'm only here for a while. Like, why should I even be thinking about Baltimore? And we are going to try to make the case today that you really cannot avoid not thinking about Baltimore. And a lot of the issues Baltimore is facing, we really run into everywhere. Anywhere you work, there's going to be issues of class, of privilege, of race, of ethnicity. And if you start the long process of sorting it out now, it's going to help you uh, elsewhere with your work. So I have an all-star panel uh, flowing in here at great expense. I have Corey Bradley up here, who is a gentleman and a scholar and also a doctoral student in health behavior and society, but we aren't going to ask him anything about that. <laughs> uh, we have Tiana Burrell, who gives us all sorts of admin support on fifth floor, but among other things, she runs a call-in show uh, online, and that show often deals with issues of race, of crime. She's had a lot of police officers on, and she's had a lot of so far, nonviolent interactions with police officers. Um, as far as we know. As far as we know, right. Uh, and then uh, it's my privilege to introduce Hanifa Salim, who is new but not new to here. Um, she was born and raised in Washington, DC at the height of the war on drugs. Uh, she first came to Baltimore as a freshman undergrad. Johns Hopkins. Then she came, she left, she came back, did her master's, left, came back, did her doctorate, left, came back, and now she's an assistant professor. And she brings uh, a lot of other angles to the conversation. I look forward to hearing from her. Finally, uh, Sarah Murray, who's on mute right now uh, because there's little kids in the home. Um, but we'll be bringing her on later. She was born and grew up in Charlottesville, and she's going to share some secrets of Charlottesville that you might not have heard on CNN um, a bit later. So um, I'm going to give some background on recent events in Baltimore. We're going to have a discussion. Depending on the discussion goes, we may listen to a clip from Marisela Gomez, or we may just keep discussing. And then I'm going to finish by talking about some resources. So there's been a lot of events. Um, recently, at, unfortunately, I, the events related to crime and justice and race are getting crowded out by current events related to flooding and natural disasters, but uh, 
these things keep happening. Um, there is a historic legacy of racism and oppression, which is in really the foundation of these events. There's uh, problems of police community relations, uh, problems of accountability, and then disparities across many domains. And I'm going to show a few slides about disparities in a minute. Um, and then the issues with how the media covers these, how the media portrays different kinds of people, um, and sometimes portraying the victims as the perpetrators or vice versa. Um, in a way, the Baltimore events, um, the stage was set in Ferguson and other places with the fatal shooting of Michael Brown in August 2014. And then there were several waves of responses from the affected communities to that. And among other things, that got people in Baltimore and elsewhere sensitized to what some of the issues were. And then when an issue came here, people said, hey, uh, let's not let this go by. Let's really work it through. An issue that came up was Freddie Gray. Um, Freddie Gray was uh, walking around, wasn't doing anything in particular, but he was known to police. And when the police saw him, he started running, and they ran after him, and they put him into the van, and somehow between getting into the van and getting out of the van at uh, Central, he suffered extensive trauma. Um, and then he passed away a few days later. And this set in motion events, but also conversations. Uh, the state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, filed charges against six officers. Um, and that started a long series of events. There was a decision of separate trials for each officer instead of trying them all at once. Um, and eventually, all the charges were dropped, uh, which a lot of people were not very happy about at all. Um, but Baltimore being Baltimore, things don't end. Things continue. So this year, uh, seven officers were charged with racketeering by the US Attorney's Office. And just this month, I know we're at the end of the month, but it's a long month, uh, body cam videos showed officers planting drugs on residents of the city. Now, you always hear people in the media say, oh, why are people so suspicious of police? Why don't they trust the police? Why don't they support the police? Well, this is the kind of thing that makes people not want to support the police. And it's not like a minor thing. This is like a major violation of people. Um, so there was a response. And although the temperature seems low here in the building now, if you were here in the spring of 2015, uh, you know, some days we'd have classes and half the students would be gone because they'd be downtown protesting. There was a real atmosphere that we got to do something now. And as always, there were positive things and negative things. Uh, and surprisingly, perhaps, the negative things got featured in the media and the positive things not that much. There was a lot of community building and mobilization, meetings being held in church basements, in mosques, in community centers. Um, efforts to establish lines of communication with police that had never been there before, bringing different groups together, cleanup efforts. Uh, none of that got so much into the media. What got into the media is there was some burning of stores and police cars, some looting, and there was a new home for seniors just up the street here that got burned down. It's been rebuilt now, but um, that kind of thing, you know, it's playing endlessly on the TV, and look at these people, they're even burning their own senior centers. Um, and a lot of discussion about who's really responsible here for all of that. Um, so this is what Baltimore looked like in the spring of 2015. There were almost continuous protests at City Hall. Um, some days, hundreds of people, but on a few days, thousands of people. Um, how did the res authorities respond? Well, a mix, as usual. A lot of trying to help people, like making sure people had their prescriptions refilled, mental health crisis line, group counseling. But also, there was a state of emergency. A curfew was imposed. So um, I remember one day, you know, the curfew was imposed. But like all faculty, I came into work anyway. And uh, I saw a tank on Broadway. And I thought, wow, like, that's something. Um, this is what the Inner Harbor looked like. There were police with all the riot gear on. Um, so um, the mayor, the previous mayor, asked the US Department of Justice 
under the previous administration uh, to look at it. And they interviewed people, talked to people in the community, talked to police, and they wrote a report, and the link is there. And I'll, I'm happy to send out my presentation so you can follow up on these links. And um, criticized long-standing discriminatory practices by Baltimore police. Um, as a result of that, and after a lot of negotiation, the city of Baltimore and the Department of Justice entered into a consent decree. And a consent decree means you're going to make changes, and it's not like if you're in the mood, if you feel like it, like you have to make these changes. And people who are worried about the police and their behavior like consent decrees because then what the, police, the changes the police make are followed and monitored. Um, but this consent decree and all the work that went into creating it is now under threat because Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions isn't sure that we need to be so tough on the police. We need to support the police from his perspective, um, which is, and the president uh, generally supports that position, which is really disappointing. Um, homicides, what can I tell you about homicides? There's a lot. They've been going up since, and they're on track to be above 300. Um, if you want to know what's happening and who's getting killed, I mean, it's largely young black men. Uh, if you take epi or biostats, you'll know denominators are important. So if you look at a denominator of the whole population of Baltimore, homicides are high. But if you shrink the denominator to be the mostly young black men who are at risk, uh, it's a death rate higher than a lot of war zones. Like, it is... The experiences of people, and like mo most people in the most affected neighborhoods know somebody who's been murdered, and not just somebody who's been murdered at some point in the past, but probably recently. Um, so we have this homicide thing, but we also have a critical shortage of police officers, and we'll have some comments on that in a minute. Um, and Baltimore communities uh, are being tossed back and forth. There was a real feeling we've got to control the police, but now they're thinking you know, there's no police here, why don't you guys come back? Um, a lot of concern about gentrification. Um, Washington, D.C. is leading the way in gentrification. You know, you go, there's a rundown neighborhood one year, you go the next year, and there's fancy condos, but Baltimore is trying to catch up. Um, and you can see that if you go that way, but you can also see it in Remington and Canton. Um, and at the same time, uh, the low-income neighborhoods are saying, well, can't we just work together and sort this out? Um, the uh, city of Baltimore is quite concerned about this. Um, they've put together a live to be more strategy, and they recognize that often the response isn't very coordinated, so they're trying to bring all the pieces together. Um, but then also in 2017, and we're going to hear from Sarah Murray about this in a minute, there was the protest and counter-protest in Charlottesville, which looks totally unrelated, but talking to her yesterday, I heard about some relations that I hadn't been uh, aware of. Um, so back to health for a minute. We're health people, right? That's what we're worried about. We're worried about hepatitis C. We're worried about tuberculosis. We're worried about papillom papillomavirus. Uh, aren't those the real problems? Um, well, on the stuff that we're sort of concerned about, we have made some progress. We've decreased lead. Um, in some neighborhoods, most kids had a lot of lead in their blood at one point, and that's come down. Um, we've had a reduction in heroin overdoses. Teen pregnancies have been dropping fairly uh, consistently. Lower infant mortality, uh, expansion health care coverage, maternal to child transmission of HIV, which once was pretty substantial here, is really quite limited or non-existent now. So we've made a lot of progress. Um, but the homicide rate is increasing. Violence against sexual min minorities remains a huge problem. Care for mental illness often isn't there. Um, chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes. And then criminal justice, which you could think of as a justice problem, but it's also really a health problem. The health of prisoners is not good. Um, either their mental health or their physical health, and affordable housing. And I'm just going to show you this slide, but this slide could be a full year course. Uh, what redlining is, 
where the real estate agents got together and say, we're not going to give any mortgages in these neighborhoods. Um, lead poisoning, troubled schools. We could have a whole course on the school system in Baltimore, which has been desegregated, except they forgot to desegregate it when they were desegregating it. And most kids in Baltimore are in classrooms that are all black or mostly white, and not that much uh, in between. Um, so uh, JHU was working very hard on a response in 2015, and there's still energy behind that, although there was a real peak of energy in 2015. We had a day of reflection. Uh, actually, we had several re reflection events. And you can go to this site, and you can listen to some of the talks. And there's some phenomenal talks that really bring together the different pieces in a compelling way that I can't do. Um, and then student initiatives, uh, reinvigorating Spark, working social justice into the curriculum. And also, most recently, there's an anti-oppression series called Lead. Now, I've been talking about lead poisoning. And so does this have to do with lead poisoning? No. It has to do with liberation, eradication, activation, dismantling. Um, and it's being supported by a diversity innovation grant. And so if you want to think through how, what you might be doing, uh, this is a good place to start. Um, we also have a, a collaborator for violence reduction, building on the long-term efforts um, uh, on gun policy and violence reduction. And that could also be a whole lecture. So now I've come to the, I've talked enough. And I'd like to hear from you and also hear from our discussants. Uh, discussants, would any of you like to throw something in right now? Or do you want to hear for a few, few dis questions from the audience first? OK, so um, if we're unable to get you to talk, then uh, th they're going to try to incite you. But let's start with some questions from the audience. So we have a microphone here and a microphone over there. Um, any question is welcome, including, so like, what are we supposed to be doing? Or uh, any reactions you have, any personal experiences you've had with these issues, like we really welcome, or, or just saying what, what's on your mind. Uh, and also keeping in mind that with everything happening in Houston, it can be hard to focus on, oh, I should have introduced you. Yep. OK. into, and you mentioned the recent findings with regard to officers planting drugs mm -hmm. on individuals and things like that. What's, what's kind of the impact of that consent decree, or what do you see as next steps, or do you, do you view it as effective? Do either of you want to? Maybe I'll get the other this is Tiana. Well, again. from my conversations that I have with a lot of the Baltimore City Police and also people that are active in the union, um, the, the decree actually made things worse. And that's why we have the spike in crime, because these officers are being impacted from not only the citizens, but also the department and the white shirt. So they effectively don't want to work, because they're afraid that um, if they mishandle someone or um, something happens that it's going to affect their job. So they effectively sit and they do nothing. They just want to wait for calls and they effectively don't want to aggressively go out there and attack crime. So from what I'm hearing, this decree actually made things worse and that's why we have the spike in, um, in crime and in murders. So these police don't want to do anything right now and they're scared to. And just so, to, I'm Corey, to add to that, what I understand about the work that's currently happening is that they're in the, pro the city's in the process of uh, hiring the monitor or however that, yeah. So do you know more about that than I do? Because I only know like, I, only, I know it from the perspective of one of, of one of the really great organizations um, that's v very much invested in mobilizing black communities and addressing uh, the realities of black folks here in Baltimore. Um, they're called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, so LBS. And so they were advocating for a particular consultant or firm to be hired, and they felt like they'd be more effective than another, but that's the extent to which I know. Yeah, I guess from my knowledge, um, the Department of Justice uh, 
has sort of made it somewhat clear that they're not necessarily going to enforce uh, the consent decree, but the mayor and people in the city council have decided to move forward with that. Um, but it sort of takes a little bit of the teeth out of the consent decree if you don't have the Department of Justice actually monitoring. Um, and now it's sort of up to like the city to, to move it forward. Yeah, it, the lack of solid support from the Department of Justice is a huge disappointment. David, yes. Um, from an epidemiological standpoint, is there any uh, groups here at the school that are doing an epidemiology of, of um, murders in Baltimore? Well, the, uh, you know, the, the Gun Violence Center in HPM, they, they've been on that uh, for years, and um, I, I mean, through a lot of their history, they've been analyzing things, you know, the nationwide level and looking at patterns, but recently, they're really focusing on Baltimore and really trying to make a difference in Baltimore, and one thing they've been trying to do is improve data collection and analysis by the police, because the police often collect the data and then sort of sit on it and don't really look at it. So they're saying, OK, well, you have these data. What can we do uh, based on it? So I'm not the best person to talk about this. Somebody like Cassandra Crifasi knows a lot more about it uh, than I do. Anna. Hi, Peter. My question has to do with gentrification. And it's not something that I'm very familiar with in terms of um, how to more equitably address housing needs in uh, low-income areas. And in the past five years that I've li lived in Baltimore, I did see kind of the neighborhood around here get transformed in a way that I'm not necessarily happy with. And I was wondering, like, what are some ways to um, to do this in a yeah more equitable way? Well, maybe I could start by saying some of you have just arrived in Baltimore maybe a week ago, but um, if you walk out the front door here to Wolf Street. And if you walk that way and go down the hall, you're going to see, go down the street, you're going to see a new hotel and some new office buildings. And then you're going to see a park with fountains and stuff. All of that was row houses. And those row houses were decaying for a number of years. Um, like, so on some blocks, or only a couple of them were occupied. But um, Still, you know, like people were living there, living their lives. There was some community spirit, even though it might not be obvious to us driving through. But the decision was made to uh, knock down quite a few blocks and then start building um, apartment buildings, hotels, uh, the Maryland State Laboratories, uh, and other things. And well. It's re it's really creates mixed feelings in the community. I mean, a lot of a lot of community members feel Hopkins is really violating them, and it's a land grab, and you know they sort of feel like the uh, Sioux or the Apache or the Cherokee or anybody else felt like when um, feel <laughs> yeah <laughs> when the the settlers came in and drove them off their land. But Corey, you, you've been very engaged in thinking about this and talking to people. Do you want to add anything to that? So so I, I can only speak anecdotally and uh, I don't have the data to support or corroborate. The conversation in the community, as Peter alluded, uh, is uh, that one of those conversations is that this has been some kind of um, it's been uh, uh, an effort of exploitation and um, capitalism at its best, uh, that people have owned land and houses and sat on them uh, and let them fall into disrepair, hoping that it contributes to uh, the decay of the overall community. And then they buy up more of those homes and then can sell them to top uh, for top dollar to places like Hopkins and all of the friends of uh, our city uh, who finance so much. So there's that idea. Um, and I would move a little further in this concept of housing. I think that, and you may already have it, thinking of housing not just as the place where a person lays down, cooks their meals, right? But this is, this is community. This is solidarity. This is belonging. Um, this is 
for some power, right? Because this other idea is that uh, that I'm aware of is that there are older folks who leave their homes to their children, but as a result of gentrification, the children cannot afford the taxes and so forth, so they lose their property. So we're now we're talking about disinheritance um, that is in in a, in the legacy of a family, and this we understand particularly in the United States is a great uh, one of the strategies by which. Um, uh, wealth is built in this country. So now we have another in intervention, or if you want to call it that, disruption in the creation of wealth among uh, disenfranchised and marginalized communities. So um, one of the things that we have advocated for paying attention, uh, and if we get to this, it's important. I mean, Mar Maricela Gomez does work on this. She has been engaged in a qualitative study interviewing residents in the community and asking them about um, the uh, EBDI, East Baltimore Development initiative and asking them about Hopkins, some of the things that they have said, uh, you know, Hopkins is an octopus. Its tentacles reach out and they just yeah. take whatever like they want. If we want. don't get a chance to listen to it, I, the, the link is here and uh, it's worth yeah, it's worth listening to the whole thing. It's really quite good. So really important to understand, um, you know, that we and she talks a little bit about how we're implicated in this as well, right? Because we as students chose Hopkins because Hopkins is and offers the resources that it does without a full awareness of how that has uh, unintended and perhaps intended negative benefits for the folks who we sh we share this community with. So um, I, th I think to your point, I think we're, if we're going to think about housing, we're going to think about affordable housing. I think there are a couple of initiatives through EBDI to offer housing to staff at some kind of kind of discounted rate. But again, this is not a preservation of the community. It's a reorientation uh, of the community and uh, folks who are continually being pushed out. So uh, that that's kind of my, you know, what I would add about uh, this idea. And I think it's an important thing for us to grapple with. When is it making life better? And when is it making life better for only a few people? I'm, di I'm dying to jump in and say something about bicycles, right? We, we, all, we, we all like bicycles. Bicycles, we do greenhouse gas emissions and all sorts of other things. There's been real pushback in some communities about construction of bicycle lanes because... Well, people like us think, oh, bikes are nice, and we're going to exercise, and we're going to lose weight and all that. Like, they, they say, well, this is the first step to gentrification, right? Like, first you build a bike lane, then you're going to start fixing up the houses, and the rents are going to go up, and then we're going to be out, right? So they don't see a bicycle lane as some neutral, cute kind of thing. They see it like this is the start of the invasion, this bicycle lane. Um, and, and in fact, let me just add, I see your hand. The, have you all heard of the, the white L and the black butterfly? Have you heard of this concept? So that the communities, I, uh, does somebody know how to say this really well? Because I'm going to fumble at it. <laughs> Anybody want to give it a try? OK, so I'll, I'll Mindy, can you do it? <laughs> all right, I want to try. So I mean, I think I understand it as the, the way that our city is kind of racially segregated so that folks are living, uh, the L goes kind of through Baltimore City in this, in this L shape. And then the black butterfly are the communities that are around the L. And so the idea that I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to discuss is that the resources tend to flow along the white L. The bike lanes that we have now, Baltimore City, we're moving into all of these wonderful things, right, with offering the bike lane, pretty much is along the white L and not in the black butterfly areas, is, is a very coarse way of describing it. Yeah, that. I'm going to bring up a map just to illustrate this graphically. Can I something about, like, Let me get you on the mic. Okay. You mentioned about um, people sitting on lots and kind of taking advantage of that and then letting the building come in to disrepair. Does um, Baltimore have policies and laws to kind of get those people off those, repossess it, kind of like give it back to the community who would support it? Um, do they have official laws? How does that work? I, no, I, don't know the, I don't know the answer to that, but that's really a creative way to think about that. Um, I'm new here, but my roommate is not. Um, and uh, we were talking about how there was a woman in the Remington neighborhood who bought a bunch of row houses and let a lot of them fall into disrepair. Um, but the city has 
repossess some of those. Um, but I wasn't sure, like, the legality of that and, like, how can you use that to the best of the neighborhood and give it back to the people who live there. But And, and as I acknowledge, like, the, what I understand about that is fairly anecdotal, so I don't know that that is actually the case, right? I don't the data that supports that. I do know that um, there was a home in West, in West Baltimore, um, it's called the Harriet Tubman House. Have you have you heard of this? Okay, you're familiar with it. Yeah. Kids from the community, and I love the um, after Freddie Gray uh, was murdered, they there was a vacant lot, so the community say, why this is empty? We have people here homeless, so they just use it and jump there. It's a nice activity and. We should join. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So they have a garden there. They do different activities. But it was under threat because the city was like, you don't own it. And some other people do own it. And they were talking about bulldozing it. As far as I know, it didn't happen. But the city would not give the rights to that particular home to the community who was organizing events. So that's, you know, just a contra, you know, distinct. Uh, I want to come back to your L and butterfly. Okay. So um, this is a homicide map. And this is one wing of the butterfly, and that's another wing of the butterfly. And besides homicides, these are areas with abandoned houses, concentrated unemployment, uh, trash, all sorts of things. And then the L uh, goes from North Baltimore, kind of comes down here and comes along here. And you'll see, like, in this area especially, like, there's almost no crime, almost no homicides. So there's this... Um, it's like a, it's a bit of a backwards L, and then the two wings of the butterfly, uh, wings filled with homicides. Um, so, another more questions? Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, I heard about the tent city protests that were um, going on, and there were I know they were around housing, but could anybody speak more to that? Um, so uh, the there's tent been a tent city and a campaign the, for affordable housing. There's been some housing. protesting about, yeah. Well, okay, uh, yeah. I'm not a housing expert, but for, what, what, what I know about Baltimore is, uh, first, the landlords have a lot of power and the tenants have very little power. It's quite easy to get kicked out of your house. Um, that we have a lot of abandoned houses and also homeless people at the same time. And... At the same time, there's a lot of feeling that the city of Baltimore and its housing policy is really prioritizing gentrification. And the reason they're doing that is to bring in more tax revenue because municipalities in this country survive on property taxes. And if you can't, you know, so when they want to bring in middle and upper class people, the city, um, Part of it, ironically, is out of concern for the poorer because they feel if they don't have the richer people paying taxes, they're not going to have money to provide services for the poor. So you, you, you get into a weird dynamic where you have to step on the poor in order to help them, which seems like totally twisted, but that's kind of how things happen in uh, low-income uh, municipalities in this country. Like, if they don't gentrify, they have no revenue to help people at all. But if they do gentrify, they're constantly stepping on people. Mm -hmm. Nino, how are you? Um, I love Baltimore. Um, although I live in D.C. now, but I, love, I lived here for four years before, and I really love this city. About gentrification, um, I think it was two years ago, like down on this um, uh, Wolf Street, um, where there is this new um, cafe now, there was this model of this whole neighborhood gentrification. And I was just walking, I didn't even know anything. I just stumbled upon in this whole big development project. I think it was like weekend or something, there was nobody who could answer my questions. but. I just had just questioned to them, like, what happens to people? Uh, but now, as I understand from you talking, Corey, it's not that they, they just moved these people recently for this gentrification. It happened years ago, maybe decades ago. And as Peter said, it's a historic perspective. And um, I also want to, like, uh, comment on what you said. It's not only just affordable housing. You're moving people from one place and you're just putting them into other places. It's about whole community and neighborhood. And 
if you haven't seen the movie Citizen Jane about Jane Jacobs' activity in New York City, it's a very eye-opening, at least it was for me, it, because it shows there are a lot of studies, urban studies, soci in sociology, economics, and stuff like that. They show that it's not only about affordable housing or just clean housing or something, it's about neighborhood. It's about being together with the people, being able to be safe in your neighborhood, know the, what you're doing. So I don't think that it's so easy just like to move people from one place to another and that's it. That's not like that. And I just wanted to touch on that, and that speaks to why we have such a, a high spike in crime, because that's one of the things that have been taken out, is the, the community feel, the neighborhood feel. So when all these people are displaced, you lose that. And that's important, and, and making sure that you know people are together, and people are watching out for their neighbors, and that's one of the aspects that we are missing with that, and that's a huge consequence of it, it really is. I just have a comment or some thoughts to share. So I grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, in the 1980s and the 1990s, and I do see a lot of parallels between sort of what I experienced growing up and what's sort of happening in Baltimore. So in D.C., the neighborhood where I grew up was called um, Smoketown, or I guess that's where people would go to get their drugs, to get mostly marijuana. Um, but what I did notice, and it sort of goes back to this idea of um, disinheritance, like in my neighborhood, there were a lot of people who, you know, there was a strong sense of community. I remember going to neighbors' homes and, you know, playing with kids in the neighborhood. Um, but then once, at least in D.C., once crack hit D.C. in the 1980s, the neighborhood became very violent. And you had a lot of people who moved outside of D.C., mostly because they wanted to provide um, a better life for their children. My father was a police officer, so he was incentivized to live in the neighborhood because that was an approach that D.C. was taking at that time in order to sort of um, build trust between the police and communities and having police officers live within the communities in which they're actually serving and protecting. Um, so we stayed in the neighborhood, but a lot of people did move out in order to, to for different, you know, for different school districts, and it was just a sense of decay within the neighborhood. And more recently, you know, that sort of, it stayed that way for about two decades, and then more recently, people started to buy up these homes um, and develop the area, and now the development is more focused on people who they want to attract into the area. Um, and it's pricing out a lot of people, and it goes back to what Corey was saying. There are a lot of people who owned the homes, and it was a common practice to just sort of pass the house down to your children or your grandchildren, but with um, the increase in development in the area, you know, it's, there's a Whole Foods there now, so it's very expensive to actually um, pay for the property taxes. Um, and so that sort of pushes people out of the neighborhood as well. But it is like this, this cycle. And I've been at the hands of like, you know, being from a neighborhood that has been gentrified, but then now living in Baltimore, I'm actually contributing to gentrification because I live in Hamden, and Hamden was a white working class neighborhood, and the same thing is happening within, within Hamden. Um, the, the faces have sort of changed and the location is different, but it's the same system. And I don't really know how do you sort of um, develop without um, pushing people out. I think we have to really like address that issue, like how can we develop for um, the entire city and not necessarily for people who we want to be in the city. So, something else I want to mention is we often are focused on urban areas and some people think, well, black people have always lived in cities, but um, Maryland historically had African-American communities all over the state from one side to the other because somebody was doing the agricultural labor and it wasn't the owners of the plantations. So, um, you know, part of white flight in the 50s and 60s, it was not only whites leaving the city, but it was also black people being pushed out of the rural areas. So like if you go to Towson, West Towson was white and East Towson was black, but East Towson became Towson Town Center and all sorts of other office buildings. Mm -hmm. Cross Keys Center, Cross Keys Mall, great place. It was a traditional African-American neighborhood. A lot of the malls in Maryland are built on traditional African-American neighborhoods. 
And I think from the point of view of the suburban counties, it solves two problems at once, right? One is you have economic development, and second, you get out of, get rid of people with different skin colors who might bring down property prices. So, like, we have the gentrification problem here, but also we've had a lot of rural African-American communities decimated, pushed out. And one other community I would mention, like, when you go along Center Street and then you see St. Paul splits, and there's a nice little park there. That was originally a slum uh, community of African Americans. And then the Baltimore mayor at some point decided that it was giving the city a bad image. So they bulldozed that and they built a park and there's flowers. So, you know, a lot of history, you know, we talk about people being moved out. So it destroys community, but also destroys history. Because now if you look at that park and you see tulips and things, and you couldn't ever imagine there were ever African Americans there, but there were. Uh, if you go to Towson Town Center, you don't see any evidence of the rich history of the African American community there in the past. All you see is uh, stores and the iPhone store and everything. But you know, people were there, but now they're like gone. There's no even trace of their history. So um, it's a big process. I'd like to bring in Sarah Murray now. And Sarah, are you still with us? I sure am. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Sarah briefly. Uh, Sarah did her MSPH with, in social and behavioral interventions, and then she abandoned us because she got very interested in mental health and did her PhD in mental health. And now soon she's going to be starting as an assistant professor in mental health. But um, I'm asking her to talk today because she grew up in Charlottesville, and I'm hoping she could shed some light on events in Charlottesville beyond what we hear on CNN and Fox News. So take it away, Sarah, and say whatever you want. And Sure. I am still, in many ways, kind of formulating how I feel and what I think about what happened in, you know, since the middle of August in Charlottesville. Um, but yeah, like Peter said, I, I grew up in Charlottesville, um, born to my, my father, who was born in Charlottesville. So we're um, it's been a city that's grown a lot, uh, you know, kind of got deep roots in the area. Um, it's been kind of bizarre to have Charlottesville be the focus um, of this kind of national conversation. Um, so I guess I can say first what I think the reaction of a lot of people I know in Charlottesville is, which is that I think in many ways it feels like what happened was kind of an invasion from the outside, um, which, you know, isn't untrue, certainly lots of um, the kind of neo-Nazi groups and the KKK that came in, a, a lot of that was from the outside. Um, and there's a lot of conversation now in Charlottesville happening where this idea, like that this was, this was an invasion and that this doesn't represent Charlottesville and this doesn't represent its people. And Charlottesville is a relatively liberal, progressive enclave within central Virginia. Um, but, uh, and, and now there's a lot of conversation too around kind of what happened and how it turned violent and who's to blame and uh, within our city council and who needs to step down. And, and this is kind of where the conversation has gone. And for me, uh, the upsetting thing um, is that it seems that we have a real opportunity in Charlottesville to talk about a lot of the things that we're talking about already today in, in reference to Baltimore, because Charlottesville really shares a lot of that history um, although it's it's much easier to ignore in Charlottesville. It's easier to look away and not see it if you don't want to. Um, so to give you an example, this the Robert E. Lee statue that is in the park, that's Emancipation Park is what it's called now, that is about two blocks from um, the area of Charlottesville known as Vinegar Hill. And Vinegar Hill is not something that you would know about other than that there was a theater named Vinegar Hill where you could see really cool indie movies. Um, that area of Charlottesville now is very developed. It's a lot of small um, restaurants, uh, locally owned restaurants that are super hip, um, lots of yuppies, <laughs> lots of, uh, means it's very um, expensive, um, very nice. Uh, Vinegar Hill was, until the 1960s, a thriving black community full of black owned businesses and black owned homes. And it was raised by the city in the 60s um, and uh, in the name of redevelopment, um, although it largely sat untouched until the 80s. Um, and all of those black families were moved into public housing. 
And that is not something I knew growing up in Charlottesville until I worked as a caseworker after college there. Um, because you would never know that Vinegar Hill in that way existed. Um, there's like one small plaque that was blocked by a trash can most of the time. Um, so you, you, I guess what I'm saying is that Charlottesville shares a lot in common with Baltimore. Um, and that it's been very easy growing up in Charlottesville to not see that um, in a way that it's hard to ignore in Baltimore. And that um, there are some voices coming out of Charlottesville, but they're hard to hear over the rest of the clamor that's kind of really encouraging introspection um, about our city and about the way that race has shaped our city and the reality for people that live there. Um, and the fact that race still shapes our city um, in terms of racial policing, um, some very disturbing things about that. Um, and so I'm hoping that as this, we don't lose that thread in Charlottesville. We don't lose that um, that ability to have some reflection over what happened and just treat this as something that happened from the outside and not see it in our own history and, and, and see where we really need to go as a city together. Um, so I think uh, even if you, I guess it's all just to say that even it kind of throughout communities, this, this thread tends to run and, um, you, you know, you'll, you'll find that if you haven't seen it in Baltimore already, it's going to be, it's, you'll, you will, <laughs> but that's my two cents. But, you know, what drives me crazy about that is that people might then go to Charlottesville and see, oh, okay, the black people are in the public housing and unemployed and maybe they don't have a work ethic, but if you know the history, you know, they had a thriving community with a lot of black owned businesses which was just inconveniently too close to the center of town, right? And now if you go to the center of town, it's all like Starbucks and stuff. Like, you just don't realize that um, there was an African-American community there thriving, uh, doing all sorts of things. It just gets, and so there's gentrification, among other terrible things. It, it feeds the uh, stereotypes, like pouring gas on a fire or something, right? Like, the stereotypes are burning brightly enough now, but the gentrification, like if people go by the results of the gentrification, aren't aware of the history, they think, oh, you know, like why do these people like to live in public housing? Well, it's like saying like, why do Native Americans like to live on reservations? Well, they don't. They were put there. They would take, like the, uh, like the uh, Lakota in South Dakota, they were on the richest land in Minnesota very productive farmland, but that was inconvenient. So they were put into arid land with terrible soil in South Dakota. And then you look at them high unemployment rate, and you said, oh, they aren't very entrepreneurial. Well, they were when they were on good land, but you put them on the crappiest land in the country. And of course, they aren't going to be very economically viable. So this makes me nuts. Anyway, I'm sure Corey can. Well, there were also some people who had things to say. Yeah. So yeah, so let's. Yeah. Oh, do you have a mic? Kellogg. Yeah, hi, thank, thank you for uh, putting this together, too. I'd like to maybe ask the panelists a little bit about what they see Hopkins being able to do, maybe short term, because some of the individuals here are master students that come in and, and have a, a period of... Yeah, I mean, or even uh, Mindy, if you want to say anything. Uh, yeah, and then there's a longer term vision. And then on my... So that's my question to, to you, what, what you think could be done. And then the comment I'm going to make, too, is, is I've only been here like 18 years, so mm -hmm. half of Peter. Yeah. But there I'm was sure. a great recession that occurred in, in the United States. And, and before that, there was going to be a biotechnology thing. There was a whole big push you know, 15 years ago of why people were doing things around the universities. And that actually collapsed. And, and then everybody was in a recovery mode. And I think we lost the vision of maybe integrating them back in. But that's more of a comment there. But I'd like to think, what, what do you see Hopkins doing? Well, I, I like the idea, the, the visual metaphor of collapse, because when you think about when things collapse, who are the people that are most deeply buried under the rubble? And I think that <laughs> our inattentiveness to the folks who are most affected by when our stuff falls, who is it falling on ultimately? I don't think we've done enough of that. And that connects me to what I think about uh, Hopkins' role and, and the work that Spark does, the perspective that Spark has. And even I'm interested in hearing more 
from students uh, and my co you as my colleagues about how this even matters to you, um, especially if you're even not even uh, a resident of the U.S. or um, you've immigrated to uh, to to the states for school or whatever the case is, or you have your family in that way uh, has done so. Um, I think that uh, so Sarah reminded me of a couple of ideas. One of them is that we should remember. Um, I, I've just this week I've driven in my neighborhood in Reservoir Hills um, by two police scenes with police tape, and instead of it actually invoking a great deal of fear in me, it, it does something kind of strange that I'm not entirely. I need to process through, but uh, there's not an alarm for some reason. But what I the way I'm processing these events, high murder rates, and everything else that happens in this city is that it is a consequence to something else, some things else. And so when I encounter situations or hear about what's happening, even when you get those rave alerts, right, uh, these are consequences of something instead of seeing them as the problem. And so the question for us as students, scholars, thinkers, leaders, is how do we get at what's behind that rave alert, what's behind um, the incidences of crime and violence. Um, so moving a little further, I think that it's a way to think about life here in Baltimore. And I think when you are going through the neighborhoods, when you're coming from your bus or you're passing someone who you may presume to not be in the School of Public Health, they may be, they may be connected to Hopkins or not, I think there's a way that we can carry welcoming, being welcoming, uh, and and this attitude that, that we share this space together, and really I more so by permission of this community, and sometimes not even by permission, by fear right that that I'm here under a different kind of mandate and so I think that affects the way that we interact with folks in the community which links me now to source because source has amazing opportunities for us whether you're here for nine months two years or whatever the case is to be able to engage and support the affirmation uh, of community members in putting your hands to the challenges that they have inserting yourself in this history is much beyond the the time that you will spend training here. You have walked into something that is much broader and larger than you individually, so you should act accordingly. You should not walk in this space and assume with, we should not walk in this space and assume with our privilege that it has begun and will end when we leave. So what do you have to contribute to the story of Baltimore, to the rising of the people of this community? It should be connected to our mission related to public health and the empowerment and the power of people to protect their own health and to chart a course for life that matches what they desire and they hope for. And so I think connecting in those ways with agencies and organizations and then also thinking about here at Hopkins, when you get a rave alert, when I get rave alerts that are absolutely ridiculous to me, and I'm not saying it's not ridiculous to tell us what's happening, but the way that it's crafted and the way that it's stated and, and you know, you can feel all of that energy through, through the email. I will reply like, what does this matter? What does this even mean? You know, what do you mean by this statement and who are you talking about, you know? So doing things like that, pushing back asking the administration here, why is this building not used by people in the community? Especially when we're not in classes, why is this not a shared space for us? So those are ways that I think we can insert in the conversation. And then I think just in a more broader way, making sure that you've immersed yourself in this so that when you leave here and wherever you go, that you carry the capacity and the facilitation to, uh, to promote change wherever you are. Okay, well, one comment I want to make is, uh, if you decide to run for president, you got my vote. I, I'd love to have you as president. But also, I think, you know, often, I think we also have to change our thinking about communities. And, like, we often think of the community as a collection of people with different viruses and bacteria and chronic diseases. Um, yeah. But not that they... So I'll give you a personal example. Like, um, I mean, my younger son, when he was in high school here, like the bus driver gave all the kids who got on that bus uh, uh, Christmas cards. Right? Uh, the crossing guard gave my older son uh, Christmas cards. I mean, the crossing guards do not make a ton of money, right? Like, she bought a card and gave it to my son, and 
So what we're thinking, like, how can we help them? I mean, they're... I mean, I felt my sons really benefited from that because they saw that these are generous people, even though the amount of money they're making is really limited, right? So, okay, we're helping them, but they can also help us. They can also show us sides of life that's completely invisible to us. Well, um, so my partner and I, like, he actually works for uh, the economic development department for the city of New York. And he told me, like, Baltimore actually receives, like, the highest, like, one of the highest, like, uh, federal assistance from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And um, so, like, what's happening in Baltimore seems like a little uncorrelated with, you know, like the, the amount of money and the amount of assistance like the city actually receives from the federal government. So we were actually talking about, you know, like the vision of the city and even more about, you know, like the corruption in like the uh, city administrations. So I'm just wondering, are there any like efforts to actually address that side of the issue? I don't know about efforts that are going on, but the corruption runs deep from education, from the Department of Housing, from the police department, from our politicians, and that is one of the issues that Baltimore faces is the corruption um, from our politicians, especially with our incoming mayor um, and the crime plan. She didn't really have an effective crime plan. One of the main things that she proposed was free college for um, Baltimore City residents, but how good is that if kids aren't making it to college age, if they're getting killed before they make it to college, if they're being arrested before they make it to college. And to me, that seems like it's more of a, a way to get more tax dollars from people to come into the city. So that's another way to kind of push people out. Because if you're offering free college, you know, it's not going to benefit the poor black kids who aren't making it to college. Who is it going to benefit? You know, so that's a way for, I'm thinking, for her to get more tax dollars into the city. So again, corruption is huge. And that's one thing that needs to be addressed is our corruption within Baltimore City. And that's one of the risk, each, issues why we can't even um, obtain and police officers. There are 700 police officers that have left. There are 60 more that are going to be leaving within the next couple of months because they feel that the corruption in the Baltimore City the Police Department is rampant. You can recruit all the amazing, good-hearted police officers you can, but as soon as you put them in a corrupt police force, it's not going to make a difference. But where's the accountability, even with the, the school and the money? Because Baltimore, what Maryland has some of the highest, um, they get some of the most money for per students, but the schools are in disarray. So where's the money? Where's the accountability? There's no accountability in Baltimore City. None. And, that, and I think that that's a really important insight, uh, speaking to this issue of what the consequence, like th what we see as a consequence of, that these are the issues of the dynamics of power. And that's why I also see Hopkins contributing once again. We And we as public health professionals, right, we call it agency or whatever we call it, we really need to be shifting the balances of power uh, in, in multiple realms and regions because ultimately I think that that impacts how people protect their health and how they live out their health journey. And the other thing I wanted to say very quickly is that my whole thing about saying hi to people and being kind uh, is not just like Mr. Rogers stuff, but if you, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Michelle Lamont, I think is her name, and she does some global work around stigmatization um, and the counter of stigmatization being recognition and talking about cultural repertoires. And so if you get a chance, you can look at some of her work. But when I talk about connecting with folks or I'm talking about recognition, I'm talking about undoing the work of stigmatized community, stig the stigma that has been placed on communities and doing that work internally and then letting that work come out of you. So that, what, you know, if, if you need a scientific construct. You can start in the building, right? You can, say hello to the clean, you can say hello to the cleaning staff. You can say hey, thank hey. you when you see somebody yeah mopping the floor. Uh, and just trying to understand where people are coming from because these people are effectively living in a war zone. A lot of them have PTSD. They really, really do. Um, and so just trying to understand, you know, what's going on in their lives, why they act the way they do, why are some of the things happening, and trying just to be a little bit more sensitive because the community does have a very, especially when it comes to Hopkins, us versus them. Um, the mistrust between Hopkins and the community has gone from generations, even with medical exper experiments. 
They don't trust the people in Hopkins. So it's important with us being here and in us being in our bubble that we do recognize that there's this other, these that they do exist, and they're like you said, they're extremely important. It's uh, we're intruding on their space, you know. So we just definitely need to be sensitive and try to understand and understand that, like I said, that they, a lot of them are suffering with severe issues, and you know, it, it's hard. So, yeah, we just have okay. to have personal responsibility. Um, if you want a copy of the presentation and you haven't given me your email yet, um, anybody wanted to sign this, but has, and then Nina over there was waving her hand and. Uh, Okay, gentleman in the back. Yes. Um, my comments kind of go directly to what, what was just being stated because I am just a regular resident of Baltimore City. I live a mile down the street. Um, I graduated from Bowie State University. But, Thank you. Uh, yeah, see, and, and, this, and this is what I was thanking you all for, for having a forum like this because what you said, the community does feel like Johns Hopkins is kind of expanding and kind of just pushing out, and there's nothing that the community can gain from it other than, you know, obviously like the students that are right here at Johns Hopkins. But I feel like forums and uh, uh, conversations like this, it helps enlighten the whole community. It's not just a Johns Hopkins thing. This is a Baltimore City thing. And me being a resident, like I can appreciate this, but if, if we had situations like this more often where we could come out and it was more inviting, like, okay, this is a forum. It doesn't matter that it's happening at Johns Hopkins. It can benefit us as a whole, as a, as as a, as a whole community, it's kind of like the idea with uh, with the police policing. Like you said, your father was a police officer in, in the 80s or whatever. They wanted him to live in D.C. because that's the same community that he was policing. And I feel like it's the same thing as a police officer. If you're going out in the community and the community is seeing you, it, it helps mend the relationship if it's broken or it can help build it up. So I feel like this is something that can be help build up the overall community. It doesn't matter what part of Baltimore that you live on or what school you went to or, or didn't go to. It's still necessary for everybody to get a piece of this information right here and it can help us grow as a whole city. Absolutely. That's it. Thank you. And I guess I didn't comment before, but I think he brings up an important point in terms of like what we can do at Hopkins. Um, at the Homewood campus, I guess they have a JSU forum on race in America. Um, and I guess they have it like every quarter or so, um, but that's like a conversation, but maybe that's something we could do here at the School of Public Health, like having forums like this where we're not just speaking amongst ourselves, but also yes. bringing in people yes. from outside of Hopkins to contribute to this conversation. Because um, I think if, you know, if you're constantly aware of what's going on, then, you know, we're all good people, hopefully. Like, I'm sure we're all good people and we will want to act in some way, but it's just like being aware and being sensitized on the issues that we're facing. But, by the way, on the Homewood, if you're ever on the Homewood campus and you're at Eisenhower Library, along the little path going towards the uh, stadium, there's a little plaque about Homewood campus's history as a plantation, and they have a list of the slaves who lived there in the, in the mid 1800s and the price for each one. Names and prices, like it's just shocking. You have to see it. It's uh, just steps away from Eisenhower Library. Uh, Nina. Um, I guess two comments. I, it happened a year ago. I don't know if it's still available through Source, but talking about the historical perspective, there was a really good forum on um, structural racism and kind of the history, specifically of Baltimore City, looking at things like housing policies, transportation, and infrastructure of the city to get an understanding of how we've come here today. Um, and they run historians from around the city. So I don't know if you can still access that um, through the Urban Health Institute and through Source, but it was a really good perspective for me as a Baltimore City resident to just know more about what's going on in my community. And then second, as like a more- I love that you called it my community, yes. <laughs> and second on like a more personal note, being a student here and then transitioning to living here and choosing to continue to stay, one of the best things I found is to actually get engaged in a program outside of Hopkins because um, there's so much rich stuff going on that can put you out into the community and out into you know a different world and a different way of life. So um, I did Back on My Feet, if you're a runner, that's a great program because it brought you through areas that I probably wouldn't walk through down North Avenue by myself. But you know, running with a group of people at 5.30 in the morning, you wave hi to people who are taking the bus to work. Um, you get to see a different neighborhood. 
And then Circle Voices is another great organization that's really trying to bring people together from all different spaces to have these conversations, like this forum um, and beyond. And so thinking of ways we could partner with those groups as Hopkins and then also just as people in Baltimore City would be cool to think about. So. Um can I Maybe. jump in, Peter? Um, so you, you asked the right question about some of those resources, right, the right timing. Uh, did you introduce yourself? Uh, this is a no, very important person. Oh, please. Uh, we're all important people. I'm Mindy Levin. I'm the founder and director of SOURCE, which is the Community Engagement and Service Learning Center, not only for public health, but also for nursing and medicine for all three of the Hopkins Health Professional Schools. Um, Corey, thank you for recognizing the work that we do. He also serves on our student governing board. And some of the resources that you mentioned, um, every year we have events throughout the year to bring in our community partners and community leaders to help educate all of us about what's happening in our communities. Um, you know, we like to often say, from the community's perspective, we don't really want to talk about the community without the community being with us. So nothing about us without us, right? So we bring them in to be our educators and our teachers and hope to have a reciprocal relationship. And so a lot of the events that you mentioned, um, the first week of October every year, we put together what we call Baltimore Week. And we have a lot of those videos from the last from last panelists from the over the years that are all on our website. Um, we have a great lineup for this year's Baltimore Week as well. So you'll, you'll be hearing more about that. We also have a small series of online modules to help prepare you to do work in the community. And one of the first modules is the history between Johns Hopkins and East Baltimore. And it's not meant to be a, here's a pretty picture, Hopkins is so great. We talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that stuff. And it's not us talking about it, it's community members talking about it and talking about the redevelopment of the EBDI park. Um, I constantly am asking students, particularly the a lot of the med students happen to live in the 929 building. We go, how many people live in 929? Lots of hands. I'm like, let me tell you about the families that used to live there before they were displaced. And people at 99, I feel like they should probably have some kind of information at that building to talk about that community, right? We're having bringing in a lot of new students that are living there from our three schools. So we have a lot of that information available. And then depending on the time that you have, it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of time, a lot of time, if you want to do something with the community, and I say with the community in collaboration and partnership, there's all kinds of opportunities. We partner with about 100 different nonprofits here in Baltimore City, including Back on My Feed and many of the others that have been mentioned as well. And you can, we can connect you. Um, there's internships, practicum, capstone projects, or you just want to tutor a kid. All, everything under the sun that's available, and we're more than happy to sit down and talk about those opportunities as well. So thanks. Thank you. Um, so we're getting close to the end, and soon we're going to be get a new wave of people coming in here for fundamentals of international health. I want to. One more question. One more question. All right, Peter. Been waiting for a while. Right. Yeah. Stuart. Um, a couple different perspectives. One of the things that um, I noticed, particularly in late April two years ago, and this is partly responsive to, I think, what Philip um, was saying, was that it seemed as though this university finally woke up and realized that they have literally billions of dollars of resources, buildings, et cetera, all throughout town that was at risk. That was a pretty scary time. There could have been, it seemed like, almost attacks on Hopkins. And the university finally thought, oh, we really ought to improve our relationships with Baltimore communities. And the, you know, the buy local stuff, you know, everything really took off after that with the university trying to make amends for multiple decades of not caring at all, in many cases, about what's going on in town. Another thing is that my understanding, based on a lot of research that my wife has actually done, or reading that she's done, she's an IH professor, um, about the history of the drug scene in Baltimore is that drug organizations actually targeted Baltimore because of its relatively small police force, as opposed to, say, New York. And that made a huge difference. And of course, one of the things that happened in the uprising, the, the, the destruction a couple of years ago, was pharmacies around town were hit like crazy. 
And all of a sudden, there were all those drugs. And again, my understanding is that the spike in murders started then and continues um, because there were just so many more drugs all of a sudden available. So uh, I'll close on a, a, a brighter note. Uh, we've been here 11 years. I think Baltimore is one of the most fascinating, fantastic, uh, interesting, quirky, creative places that I've ever been to. I worry every day, though, whether my wife is going to get home from school safely. And I'm here sometimes as well, teaching. Um, so enjoy it, <laughs> but be careful. Yeah. yeah, as I like to say, you're not in Omaha. So I'd like to talk briefly about some uh, resources. Um, if you haven't done the implicit bias test, you should. And you'll find out that all of you are racist. Um, <laughs> and it's humbling. Um, we've been talking a lot about privilege and power. Uh, th this is one book that uh, a lot of people are reading these days. And you, there you can download the PDF. Um, Frederick Douglass. Uh, Many of you might have had to read his book in high school, but being high school, you might not have paid attention to it. Frederick Douglass lived in Maryland. Um, part of the book is in the Eastern Shore, and, but a lot of the book he is in Fells Point. He's in Fells Point during the time of slavery, and he gives quite a vivid account of what it was like to live in Fells Point as a slave. This is a book that's about 100, 110 pages. You can read it in a couple hours. If you want to see what Fells Point was like, um, and there's little tidbits of information he gives, like, for example, that slaves didn't get winter clothes. They largely went through the winter wearing rags or not having any footwear, um, that they got very little to eat. I mean, it's really um, horrifying. Um, Ebony and Ivy is a very popular book right now in New England, uh, and it focuses a bit more on New England. It's talking about the Ivy League universities and their active engagement in the slave trade and in slavery. And it's got a little tid lot of tidbits. For example, most of the money to build Brown University came from the slave traders who were living in Providence. And Harvard, in the early years, when a freshman arrived, you would get your room, your books, and you were given a slave uh, upon arrival. And um, some of the residences were the room for that individual who's still there. But of course, they all oh, that was like somebody. But no, it was a slave. But, um, and that's a very sobering book. Um, Baltimore had very, I don't, I don't know whether to say riot or unrest. Corey tells me I shouldn't say unrest because it implies that there's rest. <laughs> Whereas it, the people in the most affected communities, they never have rest, right? Like every day they're worried about murder, they're worried about making a rental payment. There's no rest. And if there's no rest, how can there be unrest? Um, but Baltimore had a huge um, event in 1968. And uh, the National Guard and the Army occupied uh, Patterson Park. And uh, it was a massive event. Um, Spiro Agnew, who is then the governor of Maryland, brought community leaders together. And he thought, they thought he was going to talk about how to work together. But instead, he dressed them down on national television, and Richard Nixon saw Agnew on TV and said, that guy is a real bleep. Uh, and he said, you know, that's the kind of guy I want working with me. Uh, he's such a jerk. So, um, so, and also, if you go here, you can see photos of what it looked like at that time. All the houses burned down. If you go over here, you see the Under Armour field looks beautiful. I mean, that was a, a shopping area, dense housing. I mean, it was all burned down at that time. Brown in Baltimore is about desegregation or how it didn't quite happen here. Takes you through the whole history of race in Baltimore schools. Not My Neighborhood um, talks about how race has played out with housing. And Baltimore has had two phases of segregated housing. In the first phase, the main street larger houses were white and the alley housing was black. And then in the second phase, you had entire neighborhoods that were white or black. But it describes that and described how it happened. And it's really complicated because there are whites, blacks, Jews, Germans, and others all interacting. And 
jumping on each other at different points in time. Um, WYPR has a series where they uh, feature one neighborhood at a time and have people from that neighborhood talking about their neighborhood and their attachment to it and why they think it's a great neighborhood, even though we might drive by and think this place looks pretty bleak, but there's a lot happening. Um, and then getting involved, uh, source, of course, and source.jhu.edu, you should uh, visit that site definitely. Spark. Um, then Engage Baltimore, These are, this is the events we had with a lot of speakers. And then finally, lead. Now again, lead, we aren't talking about lead poisoning, we're talking about lead. Um, it's an anti-oppression series. And on September 13th and 15th, um, there are going to be uh, sessions to give you tools, frameworks, ideas for um, how to participate in this uh, challenge we're all facing. Thank you all for showing up, and I want your, your, the sheet with the email addresses.